All right. Well, hello, Cassidy. Hi, Jamie. It's nice to see you. I am um, calling you from Harrisonburg, Virginia, um, home of James Madison University and the Psi chapter of AST. Um, and this is part of a, a series that we're going to do uh, as a follow on to Coffee with the Council to help our members get to know the National Council a little bit. And so we're going to start with you um, and some questions tonight. Um, personal questions, questions about leadership. Um, and so we'll try and keep it conversational and, and easy, but we want to make sure our members get to know you. So first of all, uh, where is home for you? And if you are not at home, what part of the country are you in right now? Yes, uh, home for me is Van Horn, Iowa. So it's a really small town in rural Iowa. So about like 600 people or less. It's where I grew up and I went to high school there and grade school, all of that good stuff. Um, so that is home to me right now after I recently graduated from the Uni University of Northern Iowa, but very cliche. I have big city dreams. I hope to move to a big city sometime um, and kind of stay there. So I'm not sure that small town Iowa will be home forever, but it will always have a special place in my heart. And right now I'm actually not too far away from where I grew up um, and where my parents still live. I'm actually spending some time with my boyfriend Levi at his parents' house in the Cedar Rapids, uh, Iowa area. So about 45 minutes away. It's kind of a bigger town. We have like a grocery store 10 minutes away. So it, it's pretty good stuff. Good. Well, that makes me think of two questions. So first, um, why the University of Northern Iowa? The, so the University of Northern Iowa is about an hour and 10 minutes away from my parents' house. And I have two older sisters who are about eight years and six years older than me. And they were both uh, you and I grads. So I kind of always knew of you and I growing up. I had gone up there a lot for different visits and whatnot. And one experience that stood out to me the most is I was probably in like sixth grade. I went up to stay with my sister and they did this like free campus event and we watched a movie and had free popcorn. And at the time I was like, oh my gosh, that this is amazing. Like why would no one else come here? Um, so I, it had me just like feeling really good about the campus. And um, when I got a little bit older, I started touring different campuses and I always kind of felt at home, I think because of that experience at UNI. Uh, I really knew, you know, people that had gone there and everyone I had talked to enjoyed the experience a lot. Um, I also loved their campus. So it was a little bit bigger, but not um, somewhere that like I couldn't walk from the house that I was living at to campus. And that was kind of important to me. Uh, so I settled on you and I, and in the back of my mind, I kind of knew what I wanted to study. I wanted to go into fashion. And at first I wasn't sure if they had a program, but I was like, maybe I'll do some PR or something like that. But it ended up that they did have a textiles and apparel program. Uh, it, it was a little bit smaller. So I got involved with that and it just felt like home, um, especially after joining Alpha Sigma Tau, which was founded on UNI's campus the same year that I was a freshman there. So it all came together in beautiful harmony and I'm really happy with my choice of school. Awesome. So two things there. You said you are a small town girl with big city dreams. What are the big city dreams? Yes. So recently it's kind of changed. I feel like you can plan, plan, plan all you want for, um, you know, like going through college. But my boyfriend got a job opportunity in Miami, which is really exciting. And I kind of said, you know, if I can find something Thing down there I'd be happy to go with but I've also been looking in like the Atlanta um, North Carolina South Carolina areas so like Charlotte Charleston all of those places um, and I thought you know this is probably a city that I won't end up in forever but I would love to kind of experience it as a young adult um, so I've been looking there for jobs recently but my mom is actually from Rhode Island and I have a lot of family like about nine aunts and uncles out in the Boston area. Um, so I think that I will eventually end up in Boston, which is my absolute favorite city. And I'm a huge Patriots fan. So um, I, I've always said I'm, I'm going to live there, but I, I do really actually like the city and could see myself being there for a long time. So are there things specifically within your major or things that you've done 
um, with internships that you know you really want to do once you you get out there. I know you're you know trying to land that first job, um, and that's a, a challenging time for, during COVID. So I want to ask you about that too. But yeah. are there certain things that you're targeting and you feel like you'd be really interested in doing? Yes. So I think what I kind of want to start out in, and this could change, especially in the um, time of COVID, um, but I would love to be an assistant designer at some type of women's wear company. Uh, so recently I have found some that are uh, active wear, which is kind of like a hot thing in the retail industry right now. Right now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially right now. Everyone's like, I need lounge wear because I'm sitting at home and I'm trying to be healthier. So I need active wear. So I thought that would be like a good place to start. Um, and I previously have interned at Jockey International in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So the undergarment company, that was a great experience. I got some experience working on the raw materials team. So that was more like talking with our factories overseas um, and, you know, like making sure that they're developing trims that we're looking for, for uh, a sports bra or uh, like a bralette or something like that. So it gave me a good base of industry knowledge and kind of how to work with those vendors. But now I kind of want to take it into the creative area and do some stuff with um, being an assistant designer, which is kind of like an entry level position in this field. Awesome. Okay. So back to what you said earlier about plan, 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 right? And especially yeah. during COVID. And I know you um, helped with some of the TAW talks early on during the pandemic for ASTs that were entering the, you know, getting ready to graduate or were new graduates. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about like resilience and how that has played a role in, in how you conducted your job search and maybe what advice you have for recent grads who are in the in the same boat as you? Yes, so it kind of hit me, I would say probably like mid-April, I was like, this this is really not good. It's starting, it was starting to really affect the retail industry, especially. Um, so I heard of like companies going bankrupt that I was actually applying at, and I was like, wow, this, you know, <laughs> it was just going downhill really fast. Um, but something that I try to be mindful of, mindful of is that like it, it wasn't just me in my industry like going through this. I felt like I was talking to so many different people um, and upcoming graduates that are like, you know, I, I thought I had a plan and I thought I was going to do this, but it's not really working out. Um, so I tried to be mindful that, you know, like as much as I can plan, you know, this is like a different route. I think that I really wanted to remind myself it's teaching me how to be resourceful, uh, especially in the age of social media. I kind of turned to that and I reached out to some industry professionals that I really like their creative work or kind of admire the position they're in. And I just tried to connect through them um, through that and, you know, set up informational interviews. And it kind of allowed me the time to really take into my own hands and um, you know, think about what do I actually want to do? Because I always thought, you know, I had this one vision, I want to be, you know, an assistant designer or something. But through the past, like probably two and a half months, that's kind of developed into, you know, where do I want to go after that? And, you know, what do I want out of this experience? What can I bring into this experience? Um, so it, it did really allow me the time to kind of take a step back and, you know, appreciate what this is teaching me. And, um, Yes, the, like you said, the resilience of just doing a million informational interviews and getting as much information as possible, uh, because I feel like I, I do feel more confident now after doing those. They all said, we understand what you're going through. You might not have a job right now, but, you know, I think that everyone's pretty understanding that the, what state of the industry is in. So tough at some points, um, you know, like seeing all of the internships canceled and whatnot. Uh, but it was kind of fun to take some time to go on LinkedIn learning and learn some skills I hadn't had before and kind of like check those out. So I was still trying to like be, you know, professional, be ready in the professional area, um, but kind of take time to do some things that I was actually enjoying in my own creative space as well. So have you had a break, right? So we went from, you started the spring semester of your senior year. Yes. Um, did you go on spring break? Somewhere? I did have one spring break. I came home and I hung out with my parents because this is actually a funny story, but at the beginning of the semester, I was like, I don't know when I'm going to make it home to see them. You know, I'm like really worried 
about this amount of time that I, I don't think I'll have to spend with them. And then I got like three and a half months with them. So I was like, be careful what you wish for. But it was actually really fun. I had a great spring break, just like laying low. Um, I celebrated St. Patty's Day with them. We're Irish. So that was, that was kind of fun. It was just us three. Uh, so yeah, no spring break. So I was just like kind of at home from the middle of March to like indefinitely pretty much. <laughs> We're all in that same boat together. Um, yeah. So how do you then, how are you staying in touch with your chapter sisters and is the chapter doing anything fun like to stay engaged virtually? Yes, so we did Zoom calls, which I'm sure most chapters were doing. And uh, those were kind of fun because I feel like it was a, it was nice to see where people were at or you know, like if they had come home, it was fun to see like their little siblings um, what they're doing like in their spare time. And then I actually was, I ended as the director of alumni engagement. Um, so that was kind of fun to bridge that gap of like me becoming an alumni and also setting up like a Zoom call. Um, we're, like I said, only we were a four year old chapter. So we don't have a huge alumni base. And that was kind of nice to set that time up to kind of reconnect with those women who hadn't been back in a few years. Um, and then I think that we've all done a really great job staying involved on social media. I feel like that is our, our, our prime space to, you know, like check in on one another, but I'm also a huge FaceTime person. Um, so I've had a lot of FaceTime calls in the past three months. Oh, I didn't know that about you. I'm going to start to FaceTime, you know, instead of texting you. I love you. that, baby. <laughs> Do. Even if it's something really quick, I, I do love FaceTime. Um, and I usually answer FaceTime. So I never like ignore a FaceTime. Not that I ignore calls, but if I'm like busy, I will stop what I'm doing to get on a FaceTime. So I, we FaceTime with my parents for the first time on, I think it was Father's Day. Ooh, do you, it was good. They No problems. Um, do you FaceTime with your parents and with your family? I do. My dad has a flip phone still, actually. So it's like all the responsibility is on my mom to get that done. Um, but she is like, she is the, not the worst. I don't want to say that, but she is kind of the worst. She'll always have the camera flipped and like, forget that <laughs> we're looking at like the ground. Something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's been a learning curve with them. Um, but now my face, my mom and dad love to FaceTime us. They love to like bring us on walks around the town if we're not home. Um, so, so that has been fun. I guess we've been doing that more with my sisters, um, uh, FaceTiming them and like seeing their dogs, but I love that you did it with your parents for the first time. Yeah. They figured out Zoom. So they've got tons of activities. They're doing all kinds of stuff. Oh, so. wow. So have they FaceTime with anyone but you? Like, do they have their friends FaceTiming? Or not that I'm aware of. And I feel like maybe I don't need to know. <laughs> <laughs> If they want to do a happy hour, they can do it. They can do their thing. Uh, so that makes me think a little bit about just like technology and like life hacks, like technology hacks, deep productivity hacks. Like what is the secret to like unlocking your life? Like, is there a certain app or like, I don't know, do you use a paper organizer? Like how do you stay on track with all of the things that you're doing? Yes, I do like to feel organized. Um, and through that, it's kind of dangerous. I love to like get thing, new things to help me be organized. Um, like, you know, a paper planner, even though sometimes I like, I, I'm not good about writing down every single note on paper, but I love to have these like cute little things at my desk to help me stay organized. But really when it comes down to it, so I was thinking of this the other day, I was gonna order something new and I was like, I don't really need that use my Google calendar all the time. So I, I've made it a goal that like, if I set something up, I have to do it immediately, put it in the calendar, like put it on the home screen of my computer. So I, I see it and I don't forget about it. Um, and then I do enjoy staying up to date with kind of like the fashion industry and whatnot on uh, social media. I do enjoy social media, but sometimes I have to do a cleanse. So I just have to delete it <laughs> off of my phone um because i get i get really sucked in you know especially during corona i've found that like there are so many brands that i love and i like their content and i like looking through it and making 
um, like vision boards and stuff like that, but it does get out of hand sometimes. So right now, actually, Instagram is deleted off my phone. I, need, I needed to take some time to read it back in and like actually make the mood boards instead of like saving all of the good pictures. I understand. And I will admit, um, you know, one of my habits is sending you things like events and webinars and like podcasts and stuff and articles and say, hey, have you read this? Have you seen this? So I'm sure I'm not like helping that situation. Well, during school time, it was like very much a good distraction. Like I was like, I feel like I'm still learning, you know, industry knowledge that I can apply to my classes. Um, but I actually love that. I think that you have been really helpful in kind of like, um, you know, propelling me forward with that professional edge is just like listening in on those webinars. And you really got me hooked on podcasts. Actually, I don't know if I've told you that, but I have become a podcast guru. I like to think in with actually within only my family, because it sounds like you listen to a lot of them. Um, but no, I think that it's, I go on a walk every morning now. I just pop on my beats and listen to a podcast. And um, it's been such a good way to like kind of get information and stay up to date on things while also learning something new. Yeah, I feel the same way. And I'm a like recent, you know, ambassador for podcasts. I have a, had a work colleague who kept sending them to me and I'm like, oh, I don't have time for this. <laughs> and so, yeah. yeah. So now I've got three or four that I listen to regularly and then, yeah, I tee them up for when I go out to walk the dog. So, you know. I know it is, it is so nice. And I feel like now I'd rather watch or listen to my podcast than watch Netflix sometimes, you know, like I, I do enjoy like a good show or sometimes, but I love uh, like my morning routine of getting up and uh, listening to a podcast because I feel like it it makes me feel like I'm doing something productive and I like to start my mornings like that. I totally agree and I like having a routine right so yes. same thing like get up tee up the podcast walk the dog listen to the podcast take any notes you know come home and like go about my day so I think having those routines and rituals really helps mm -hmm. and I think um, you know this is a, a this time is really hard on a lot of people yeah. Um, and so I don't necessarily subscribe to the, you know, plan of like, use all your free time or use all your downtime to educate. Right. But I do think that there, if you have that opportunity and the luxury of time and given it your circumstances, you know, taking a class on LinkedIn or listening to a podcast or whatever, reading an article about something that's interesting in your, you know, industry or your professional space or helps you with your academic career, um, yeah. I think it's helpful. So yeah. I love hearing that. Yes. And I think that it's made a difference when I like turn to podcasts or LinkedIn learning on subjects that, you know, I really enjoy. And like, I personally want to know a little bit more about, uh, because then I feel like, you know, I start talking about it in my personal life to my peers or my family. And, um, that's when it really like stops feeling like an education uh, subject. And it starts feeling more like, you know, this is what I'm passionate about and kind of like, helps me find, you know, my purpose in life. So I'm not sure if you found that because I know you're doing like a lot of LinkedIn learning and whatnot, but um, I've really found that like, if I focus on something that I personally want to know, it stops feeling like kind of a chore, which I've appreciated. Yeah. I think that's right. And I think a podcast or a small course like online or maybe through like an association or some club that you're a member of or something through LinkedIn learning is a good way to kind of get that initial taste of an issue or a topic that then you can decide, okay, yeah, I, I want to do a deeper dive on that. Um, yes. And so that's how I've kind of used that approach. Um, and then I think too about COVID and pandemic and all the different situations that everybody is, is having to navigate right now. And it's, oddly enough, being home all day, every day, I'm actually watching way less TV than I did before the pandemic. Um, so if you were to ask me like what I've binged lately, I, you know, I have a couple answers to that, but not a lot, but is, are you watching TV and you mentioned Netflix? Like what are, what have you binged recently? What's good? Yes. Well, it is funny that you say, I feel like I, I really do like watching good shows. Um, like that's kind of a, a way that I find to kind of unwind. Um, but I've noticed that I, during COVID, I really haven't watched as much maybe as I used to, or like I, I don't binge as bad as I used to, because I feel like I do have a little bit more time. So I don't feel like I'm 
I'm procrastinating something else mm. and watching Netflix. Um, I gotcha. Okay. So I've been very proud of that. <laughs> um, but something that I have been watching recently, I was just thinking about, I need to finish the last episode. I can't believe I've forgotten to do that. Um, but Killing Eve is on Hulu. Oh, so good. Oh, it is. I love the characters. I just love the development of like through the seasons. Um, so yes, I have one more episode left of the latest season. I'm very excited to watch. Oh, and well. the costumes. I mean, they've done so good. And I'm not just saying this because you're a fashion person, but like, I love the characters and the costumes, especially the yes. evil protagonist, Villanelle. Yes, Villanelle. <laughs> amazing. Is yep. I know. I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because, I mean, like, even the setting, they're, like, over in London, and she's, you know, in Spain and all of these crazy places, but the outfits, like, really, they just sucked me in a little bit. I feel like it just even added to the plot of the story, which is great already, but her, like, luxury designer outfits were so beautiful, um, and, like, her, even her, you know, like, cute, aesthetically pleasing apartment, I just feel like it just all kind of uh, wrapped me in, but, yes, I love that you've seen it, because I'm trying to spread awareness of how good the show is, and, like, you, you gotta get a Hulu subscription if you don't have one, because it's really good. Yes, and I love that most of the characters are, and the leads are strong female leads, right, yeah. and they don't, you know, I can think of three or four uh, and they don't crowd each other out like there is room for everyone yep. which I really appreciate yeah I, I think that they um they go so well together or they act so well together and a lot or I would didn't say that very well but um I think that they play off one another like better than I've seen in other shows and I do appreciate that uh that I feel like not that I feel a connection to Villanelle, but I feel, I feel for her in some ways that she just like has done such an amazing job and all of her, um, like all of the other actresses and actors, they all kind of like have a piece of, you know, professionalism or leadership that I really admire. So it, it has been a fun watch for many different reasons. Um, and I'm happy to hear that you have also thought so. Yes. <laughs> Uh, speaking of podcasts, though, back to that, is there a podcast or two that you're listening to right now that you would recommend? Yes. So during COVID, I, I took some time to kind of like think about um, just wellness in all areas of my life. And my boyfriend's older sister is actually a nutritionist. And so I said, um, you know, I'm, I'm like kind of interested in this. I just want to learn more about food and like you know, how that affects our body. And so she, um, has me on like some type of plan, which has been fun, but I started doing research of my own and I'm a big Hills fan, like Lauren Conrad. Um, oh yeah. The Hills, yeah. of course. Laguna oh, Beach. Yeah. Yes. Laguna Beach is where it all started. And you know, I can't talk to someone who likes the Hills, but hasn't seen Laguna Beach because they don't understand. They don't understand. And frankly, <laughs> if you haven't seen the OG, the GOAT, the OC TV show. Okay, now I guess I gotta watch that, Jamie. You have to watch it. Yeah. Which I have really, to. you could argue if you go goes back to like Melrose Place and the original 90210 oh, okay. kind of alternate universe here. But yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. so tell me about The Hills. What's the... So The Hills, um, I, I'm definitely team LC in The Hills, but her like I don't know if they were best friends but like her best friend Whitney I always really liked her because yeah. I thought she was super sweet and uh she interned at Teen Vogue or wherever yes I and can see was, that yep she was never starting the drama she was just like always there like helping <laughs> Lauren you know at work <laughs> um deciding not to go to Paris I'll never forget that episode I can't believe Elsie did that to us but um no I always thought Whitney was really great and she actually has a podcast called With Wit and she okay. interviews industry professionals. Um, so like tons of different people have been on, whether it's, she has a baby right now. Uh, so it's been like, you know, doctors for children's health and um, skincare experts. But she had a podcast recently with Kelly Levesque, who is like a celebrity health coach. And I'm always very weary when I'm a big snack person. I love snacks. And when someone is like, oh, you should substitute the snack for like, 
this healthy version and it, it's never as good. So I like revert back to my old ways of snacking on like Cheez-Its or goldfish or something. <laughs> um, she actually had some killer recommendations in this podcast with Whitney and she just talked about like kind of healthy living and um, what that can look like while also still, you know, like enjoying what you're eating all of the time, which is important. So I love to bake and I love to cook and I want it to be healthy and like good for my body at the same time. Um, so I found like a new coffee recipe that she shared. I'm, I'm very excited. It like substitutes my Starbucks latte, which I never thought would happen. Um, so that's been, that was really exciting. And like, I, I cannot stop talking about it. I think Levi is like, okay, I get how good the <laughs> latte is. <laughs> you got to stop talking about it every morning that you have it. Um, but I really enjoyed that. So Kelly Levac also has her own podcast that I've started listening to, and I think she does two podcasts a week. Uh, so she also talks to like sleep doctors, um, tons of different people. And I feel like it's just been interesting and a good way to wake up and learn about like how to be healthier or, you know, like just add some healthy things into my life. So I've enjoyed that. And I hope that it continues um, after COVID time slash when I get a job, because I have really enjoyed to kind of doing that now. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah. And that, were you interested in women's wellness as like when you were growing up? Or is this something that you've kind of come around to because, you know, AST has a women's wellness initiative and it's like a little bit more kind of the front of your mind in our day-to-day -day work. What is it that speaks to you about the women's wellness initiative? Yeah, I think that uh, growing up, just having my older sisters who were so much older than me, we were at very different life stages. Uh, so like, I think I was entering fourth grade when my oldest sister was going into college. Um, so, you know, seeing her doing like all of these amazing things, I think really, um, made me look up to women in general, not that I wasn't doing that before, but I think having, you know, older sisters who were, uh, like on our student government running for those like upper cabinet positions and whatnot was really inspiring for me to see. And it kind of, you know, set a goal and a precedent for me to always continue to do those similar things throughout my high school and college career. Um, so going into college, I did know that, you know, I kind of, I wanted to be, this was a goal I had when I was younger, but um, was, you know, kind of like, climb the corporate ladder for lack of better terms and you know like be someone that can sit at the table and be a strong female you know professional that other women can look up to so when I was going through informal recruitment at UNI and I had gone to the philanthropy event for Alpha Sigma Ta it was absolutely amazing to me that they had just recently rolled out the women's wellness initiative um, and that that really spoke to me you know that they were saying like here are we're focusing on all aspects of women you know it's not just like one niche topic but we want you to give back um, your time and you know volunteer at these local communities that are directly helping the young women in your community and I think that I've really kind of latched on to that especially in the last four years is I want to give back um, specifically to whatever community I am I'm in but also the young women in that community because I think that can really, you know, help set them up for success or for having positive experiences later on down the road. Um, and not to mention, uh, but Dress for Success, I think has been a really cool partnership for me specifically, just because it does have to do kind of with fashion. And I think that I can relate to that in a way that I understand, you know, like what fashion has done for me and in terms of, you know, it's how I express myself to other people. So, um, Dress for Success has really been special to me in the last four years and kind of, you know, like help getting my chapter really involved in the one that is in Des Moines or in the Quad Cities in Iowa. So that has been a lot of fun. And I am so thankful to have this type of philanthropy because I think it speaks to all women in some type of way because it is encompassing every aspect. So in your time on the council, pre the previous council, did you participate in a hands-on service experience with Dress for Success? 
Yes, we had our first uh, in-person meeting in Kansas City, and we went to the Dress for Success location there, which I think was um, called Connections for Success. I'm sorry, I'm blinking on the actual, you know, what they used because sure. they were doing uh, life coaching and stuff like yeah. that. Um, so we were able to help organize the, um, like I'll call it the showroom where women uh, could come in and shop for clothing. And we also got to like help style them if they were looking for that. And that was really special to me uh, to be helping it out in that community. Um, and, you know, like help women find their size rack, even if it was something as small as that. Um, I really knew that it was going to be special for them because I, I watched some of them like walk out the door with 20 new outfits. And um, I know that nothing else gives me more happiness than like having an out power outfit, I like to call them, that mm -hmm. makes me feel my best and makes me feel like I can, you know, really do some amazing things. So I hope that those women that left there that day also were feeling the same uh, because it was, it was really exciting to watch happen. Yeah, I love that part of, of Dress for Success. And I wish um, more of our chapters and our alumni could have that experience. I, I think, um, you know, it's something that we're, we're, it's still a relatively new partnership and it's something that we're kind of growing into. Um, some, my experience with Dress for Success started a long time ago, but there, um, when working on Capitol Hill, there's always a House versus Senate um, challenge of who can donate the most professional attire. Um, and Dress for Success coordinates it and there's a pick up location on Capitol Hill. Um, and so that's how I, my first touch point with Dress for Success. And then over the course of time, being able to volunteer and having that hands-on experience and to see the, the women that are coming in and they're, they're being um, coached on how to interview, right? Um, and, and are coming in and they, they want to have, yeah, that power outfit that gives them that confidence to walk in and say, okay, I've got my, like, my superhero cape on, you know, I'm ready to do whatever it is that needs to be done. And that's just that little extra boost mm -hmm. of, of professional attire or medical attire, for example, um, can help go such a long way. And so I'm, that's something I'm looking forward to and, and hopeful that we can continue to expand that partnership with Dress for Success. And I'm glad that you've had that experience too. Yeah. And I think that that brings up um, something like, else that I'm a little passionate about in my personal life, but is like the sustainability aspect of it, mm -hmm. I think like is such um, an important thing in today's age is that, you know, like this is a sustainable way to say like, maybe this isn't fitting me the way that I want it to anymore. But like, I know someone else could get just as good of use out of this and maybe land a job because of this blazer. Um, you know, because usually I'm sure like, professional clothing is something that you keep the nicest in your closet. So I love that you guys like do a challenge on who can give the most, uh, knowing that it's going to like such an amazing cause. Yeah, I think that's, that's cool. And I've seen a lot of colleges do like a career co closet type of a thing where, um, that, you know, you can donate gently used professional attire that students can then use for interviews and things like that. And so I think this is, again, an area that we can, there's a lot to do in this area, but the bottom line is we, it's women helping women, right? It's women yeah. empowering women. And that speaks to me, and I, I know I hear that a lot from our members. Um, and on that note, just in terms of um, kind of what speaks to you about AST and the organization, you've talked about your collegiate experience um, you, you ran for council as a, as a collegiate member, and then you chose to run again um, now that you've graduated. What made you want to serve at the national level as a, as a collegiate? And then what made you say, yes, I want to do this again? Yeah. Um, so Kristen Ponziano, who had the collegiate national vice president position before me, had reached out, I think it was my sophomore year now, um, and said, you know, this is an opportunity at the national level. You know, I just want to kind of, kind of a longer process than that. Um, but I had been serving on my chapter's exec board for two years at that point, and I was really coming to understand after attending Officer Academy, actually a few months before that, I was coming to understand what this organization was. And I really saw that um, it, was, it was much more than just like little chapter, not little, but chapters across the country. It was really 
a network of women helping women, like you said. And um, I kept seeing that time and time again, just connecting with people over Facebook and women from other chapters. And then I sat on a special task force to kind of look over some things before that upcoming convention. And I really had the feeling that I was doing something for a greater cause than just my chapter, but like for this national organization that I care so much about. And, you know, we had talked about what are we going to do for upcoming women in, um, you know, at the college level? Like, how are we going to speak to them? And I think that's a continued conversation. We've talked about that since I've been on council, but at the chapter level, we were talking about that at the time. And I, I thought that was really important is, you know, how do we replicate these positive experiences in this organization that is setting us up for success in so many different areas for other women um, down the line. And so I, ran for the uh, collegiate position as a national vice president and I was elected. And I will say that I think that it was a huge learning curve at the beginning, um, kind of like sitting with other women who had their PhDs and, um, you know, like some, to one had recently gotten her PhD, Tiffany, and seeing Amanda, who's also on council right now, working towards hers. Um, you know, and Teresa that, too. So you had yes. three doctors <laughs> yes. almost, two two plus one. Yeah. And, yeah. And Catherine, who was an attorney. So I think like at first I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I'm from Iowa, which I don't know why that's like always the first thing. Like I'm from Iowa and I'm a college student, but um, it really, it really gave me the chance to sit at the table and kind of, um, you know, have a chance to say, these are the positive experiences happening at the collegiate level. I know it's not just me, it's other women. And, you know, like, let's continue to do this. So last fall, when the council, the previous council was working on the strategic goals, uh, that was something really special to me, because I think that it really speaks to the experience that we want for our collegiate women, which is um, healthy, safe, positive, uplifting, uh, and empowering each other, empowering women. And that was really important to me. And over the last two years, I'm, I'm really happy to say that I think like we've continued to do that. We've continued to provide those opportunities for women like myself and for future women, which is exciting to think about. And so I decided I wanted to continue my time on the council because I felt like I still had, um, not only a lot to learn, but, you know, a lot to discuss from what we had started on the previous council. So I'm really happy to be doing that uh, again for the next two years. And I'm excited to see kind of what we'll have in the works um, in that time. Well, I love hearing that. And it's a point of personal pride, pride for AST. Um, and I think for, I mean, for me and for the council members that have come before that there are you know, 26 groups um, that are belong to the National Pentelina Conference, and we are the only one with a collegiate member on the council. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that change is not new. I mean, that happened many, many years ago. Um, and I think has been one of the most significant ch changes that we've made within the organization because it gives the collegiate members a, a voice at the table um, as, as the biggest decisions are, are, are debated and are made. Um, and so I'm glad that we've had um, a great, talented group of collegiate members who have served. Um, and you know, for you to be able to come back for a second term, I think helps um, with you know its continuity and you know mm -hmm. allows you to keep working on issues. Um, and then I think having a count the, the collegiate member come in for a two-year term also helps us shake things up a bit, right? Yeah. So you have a brand new voice at the table um, and I always look forward to that. And so it's something, a conversation that, that I, I'm having with Addie now as the new member of the council. Um, and, you know, she says, I, you know, I don't know if I am asking the right questions or, you know, I don't know if I know all the information and, you know, I'm trying to keep up with everything. So I'm just curious, you know, advice maybe you have for people who are, coming into a new role, right? How did you get up to speed? And like, how did you, maybe not just as a member of the National Council, but when you come into a new role, an internship, for example, how do you get up to speed? What's the best advice that you can give people who are starting something new? Yeah, and I, I feel adding on that because I think I 
is struggled with the exact same thing. And I'm sure the other um, collegiate national vice presidents did as well is that, you know, you're like stepping up into this different role and it is um, outside of your comfort zone in the best way possible. Uh, but something that I, I kept having to remind myself was, you know, like be confident with, you know, what you have to talk about. Um, and, you know, know that this, organization really does value our collegiate members and what they're going through, what they have to say, you know, you know, what they're thinking about. Um, so I tried to remind myself, you know, I want to be an advocate for much more than just my own experience, but what other women are doing across the board in 80 plus of our chapters. Um, so that was something I always tried to remember when I was like, you know, starting to get the nerves and feel those a little bit is that, sometimes you're not going to understand everything. You're not going to have all of the information because you haven't been sitting there for six years or for four years, but you have to trust that, um, you know, you're right for the time and you're sitting there for a reason. And I still think that I, I'm trying to remind myself. So I, I say that, but it is something that I even have like written on a sticky note is that, you know, like trust what you're thinking. Um, don't worry about asking all the right questions, just ask the questions that you have, or, you know, just like, um, you know, think about the thoughts you have. Don't be trying to think of like, what's right. Cause I've definitely gotten caught up in that. And then I think you get so in far into your head that then you just like stop having thoughts or you stop asking questions. And that's like the worst thing to happen. So, um, I would say, you know, just be okay with where you're at and understand that it's going to be a learning curve and, that you know other people are there to push you forward and help you learn um and you know watch you grow so i i do definitely understand being nervous but i've, I've tried to you know think about what i want to say and what i'm thinking about and hopefully you know others will do the same i know that Addie is probably stepping up into the position especially with you know returning members to council i'm sure that's a hard area but i think that she's done a very great job well, we're lucky to have her. Um, and again, I'm just so proud of our, our collegiate members who have all been really high performing members of the council. Um, and that leads me to, you know, myths, myths and facts about the council. I think a lot of people have certain assumptions about the council and the work that we do. And like, I don't know, the steps that you have to take to be a member of the council. Are there any myths that you want to bust about council service now that you've had, you know, one term under your belt? Yes, I think that my favorite <laughs> that it, it like makes me laugh every time I think about this is that um because like maybe I will be honest I did think this for like maybe the teeniest second at the way beginning of my Alpha Sigma Tau career is that National Council lives at headquarters mm. and I think that like is so funny to me is that <laughs> No, that is not how it is. Um, you know, everyone has their personal life and is doing like really amazing things in that. And they are also taking on these volunteer roles on National Council. Um, so like I, I always crack up when I hear that because although it is super fun to visit headquarters and I love it, we do not live there. We do not have a bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also, I guess one other thing is that, um, that you know like getting involved is really hard after you're a collegiate member i think that's like um you know something i at first i didn't really know but now being involved as a national vice president obviously that's a little different but like i see all of the opportunities are that are out there and there is a right fit for every single one of our members um and sometimes you know at different points of your life that is just like going to support the local chapter that you're near um just like going to a philanthropy event or reaching out and congratulating the new members of that chapter um but that's giving back to the organization that you are involved with in college and i think that is really important um for everyone to know that it is not hard to be involved um there is so many different things and i would absolutely love if everyone reached out to me and said you know like how can i get involved after uh college because that's something I'm passionate about. So those are probably my two, my two top myths that, that I like talking about the most. <laughs> well, it's funny. Number one, it, the, you know, does the council live at headquarters? I mean, it, it couldn't, it may not be that far off, but the reason I say that is because in Indianapolis, um, there's a, 
I don't know how many fraternity and sorority headquarters, but there are there, many of them are located together in the same kind of neighborhood. Um, and some of the headquarters facilities have dorms, like have space. Oh, okay. Um, where if you had a council meeting, for example, you could stay in the headquarters. Um, and there are headquarters, not just in Indianapolis, but in Memphis or Atlanta or wherever that have sleeping quarters. So maybe the consultants stay there oh, okay. um, before they go out on the road or in, well, you know, in between. Um, so it's not far off, but yes, council does not live at headquarters. <laughs> yes. Yeah, even though I think that like it would be fun to have like just a fully decked out room of Alpha Sigma Tau, that, <laughs> that is not the case. Um, but I do actually have a quick question. So has Indianapolis always been home to our headquarters since you joined Alpha Sigma Tau or was there ever anything different? No, so we, we moved to Indianapolis, gosh, it's probably been 10 years or so now. Okay. Maybe a little bit longer than that. My time is, you know, off. But before that, our headquarters, our longtime headquarters was in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and um, the sorority leased space in a building owned by the National Foundation for purchase for the purpose of, of having it as a headquarters. Um, and and, and there were other headquarters locations, you know, past national presidents probably had, you know, had headquarters in their basement, right? Yes. Um, so, but our, you know, the, the, the traditional headquarters that my experience um, as, as a, a member, um, that's what I knew. Um, that's where I went to interview to be an educational consultant was to our headquarters in Birmingham. Um, and that's where really where we started to have our first staff um, paid staff. And then when we transitioned to Indianapolis, we were looking for places that um, we could find staff that had experience in the fraternity and sorority industry okay. um, in the nonprofit higher education space. Um, and at the end of the day, Indianapolis um, being home to the National Pentelonic Conference, being home to a lot of other fraternities and sororities, um, being home to a lot of nonprofits mm -hmm. um, made it a logical choice for us. And then it's kind of like the middle of our chapter base. Yeah. And so the number of, of chapters, um, you know, that could easily, not that we need people to travel to, to headquarters, but just kind of a center of the universe spot um, that would be centrally located where, where we could, you know, we could travel to easily. Um, so a lot of diff different factors going into that, but um, yeah, Indianapolis and Birmingham to me have been are the home to AST. Okay, very cool. Yeah, I'm um, glad that you asked that because I got to work on the committee that helped kind of sketch out the criteria oh. for if we were going to move and what were we looking for and and how we were going to make all that decision. And, and the reason why I know there are sleeping quarters and other sorority headquarters is because we did a tour of some of the headquarters in Indianapolis. Okay. And so none of, I don't think any of the ones in Indy actually use their, their sleeping quarters anymore, but I've also stayed in three or four other NPC sorority headquarters buildings. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, which has been pretty cool. To like see what the sleeping quarters were like? Or were uh, you like an actual, <laughs> for so actual? <laughs> I, sh I show up, you know, with my luggage. Hey guys, can I, can I check out your headquarters? No. Um, no. NPC training, you know, Groups will offer up their headquarters. Okay. Yeah, so that's how I've had, had that opportunity. It's, it's Maybe we cool. should try to just show up at the doorstep next time we're in India. Yeah. Maybe you should. A socially distanced headquarters tour. Yeah. Hey, Data. <laughs> yeah. We're here. We're here. Um, well, I do want to switch gears a little bit and talk about just leadership and what you've what you've learned um, about yourself as a leader through your service on the council. Um, you know, you have a couple of years to reflect back on, but um, I think that's something that I've enjoyed about volunteer service for AST. And I will tell anyone who's willing to listen that I have learned more, I think, about how to be a professional and how to kind of manage a team, navigate conflict, and manage my time through my AST volunteer experience than probably in my, you know, collegiate and then early career experience. So what are some of those, what have you learned about yourself as a leader through this experience? Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more. I feel like my leadership journey really started when I um, entered into Alpha Sigma Tau. 
I was on the first exec board of our chapter and that would like kind of started this huge learning curve that I, I'm still on, like I'm still learning a lot. Um, but especially being on council, I feel like it's got given me a lot of skills that I didn't really think about before getting here. Uh, one being like the biggest being probably emotional intelligence and how mm. important that is in literally every aspect of life. So not only, uh, you know, does it affect, you know, it, it's important to have while being on council, while working with the chapter, um, but also, you know, like in your professional life and even personal life, how are you handling conflict or, you know, how are you managing people? It really is those little skills that will set you up for success that I, I've come to learn. Um, so I feel like when I was, a younger collegiate member, I really bit off more than I could chew at the beginning of my college career. I was like starting to get involved in a lot of organizations because, because that is the fun part of college is that there's so many opportunities and there are a lot of great things out there. Um, so at one point I was like, and this had been before I was on council, but I, I was, I was just so exhausted because I felt like I couldn't give more than 10% to each thing that I was involved in. And that, and that was kind of hard for me to deal with is like, you know, at that time I was like, Alpha Sigma Tau is the most important organization to me, but you know, like, why am I giving it the same amount of time or energy that I'm, you know, I'm just doing this thing on the side. Um, so I really had to do some self-reflection and, you know, like, cut back on things that I enjoyed, but maybe I do those like every once in a while. And I started to really invest time and energy into Alpha Sigma Tau and um, one other organization at college. And that gave me kind of, you know, the time in those organizations to learn skills that I really had the time to think about and reflect on. Um, so I learned a lot of time management. Um, that's probably like the biggest thing I learned because I was also working a part-time job as a bridal consultant at a dress shop in the area. And I was also a full-time student. Um, sometimes I like to forget that I was also yeah. taking classes because <laughs> in college you're like doing all of these fun things and then like, oh yeah, also class during the day. <laughs> um, so that kind of like it started with maybe time management and kind of, you know, things like that, just how to stay organized, but then it developed into better practices for managing a team. And I think something really interesting um, and what I kind of want to focus on maybe as an adult and help young college members is how to lead peers, because I think that's something at some points I kind of struggled with is that relationship that, you know, like, they're my sister, they're my friend, but they're also on this team that I'm like overseeing. And, you know, like, how do you kind of manage that? Because it can get really tricky. And um, that kind of then I then I started on council. And that's when I really started to, you know, see emotional intelligence. And now I'm kind of like continuing on that is I know I'll be starting in an entry level position as an assistant designer, but I know, you know, like I want to end up managing some type of design team in the creative space because of these skills Alpha Sigma Tau has kind of opened me up to. And I, I think we did this last summer, the emotional intelligence training, and um, you've been like such a great advocate for sharing different resources, books, podcasts for emotional intelligence, but it has been really eye-opening to kind of study that more in depth um, because I've now been able to pinpoint maybe different managers, bosses, um, peer leaders, things like that, that kind of have those like special, special little things that they do and how emotional they are with their team or who they're managing that makes them such a great manager. That's okay. something that someone I say, I want to manage my team like that. Um, or, you know, like I want to not manage it. I want to lead a team like that. You know, I want to be just as inspiring um, as they are and empower a team of creative people in the fashion industry to kind of believe in the same mission or whatever it is. So I've, I've really tried to kind of take responsibility for uh, growing in the emotional intelligence area. And I think that there's always room to do so, but it's been interesting kind of like looking back to a year ago to see how that's kind of changed for me. I love that. And take a break here. Is there anything that you want to clean up when my phone alarm buzzed. So you were talking about, um, Oh, I don't know it buzzed. 
You didn't hear. You didn't hear it. No, but I could have messed up like and not know. Did I sound a little shaky? No, you sounded fine. It's just my. I have my phone on mute, but for some reason, an alert alert went off. <laughs> okay. No, I I didn't even notice, but. Okay. Well, I've been like paranoid. I have a Mac, so I'm scared that someone's going to call me this whole time. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to like, text my most recent contacts and be like, do not call her text. Don't call me back. Okay. Well, I think they can, I think it's fine. I think they can cut, they can cut around it because you had a, you had a lot of good quotes in there. I think that's good. Um, okay. Back at it. I just have a couple more questions then um, about, um, do you have mentors? Are there, how do you use mentors in your professional career and what kind of advice have you gotten recently from your mentors? Yes, I, I definitely really value the mentors I have in my life. Um, and I think everyone on council and including yourself have really been a great role model uh, to show me things outside of sorority life as well. I mean, like you've really all shown me uh, what person you guys have achieved in your own life and it's kind of like pushed me forward to you know maybe continue my education down the road and in like a there's a program i've been looking at like global fashion management and that's something at first i was like i don't know but you know looking up to women who have been on council and kind of done that continuing education piece has really inspired me to say like i can do this this is something i can do while also maybe having a job and like doing other things and um that's been really special to me to have mentors in council that i've like kind of crossed over into my personal professional life um that being said i do have mentors like with specifically within the fashion industry that i kind of turn to more for industry specific knowledge so i think that's really come out during COVID time is um I've kind of, you know, created key relationships with a couple of different people and I, I'm kind of working on that, um, you know, those relationships continuously, but there's been some key women that I have really turned to and said, you know, what, it, what are you doing in your position right now for studying consumers and how their buying habits are changing? So kind of more like specific fashion industry things that I want to talk to them about and, you know, stay up to speed on what companies are talking about. So as an entry level position, I'm still coming in with a knowledge of like, you know, these are the things that we should be thinking about in the era of a pandemic. Um, but I think really some of the biggest mentors have been women I've met in Alpha Sigma Tau, which is something really exciting and uh, something I, I love to talk about to people going through recruitment or just, you know, maybe high school women saying this network is, is so amazing. It, it's not just being in a sorority. It's being a part of a membership who will always, you know, make those connections with you for someone in your professional field or help you grow in a personal journey that you, you never even expected. Um, so I, I've really appreciated that from, from the sorority. So a couple kind of, rapid response questions here at the end. Oh, I love these, Jamie. I've never done them though, so I'm nervous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, what is one hobby that you do outside of ASD? I bake all of the time. I love baking and uh, I'm trying to make those cinnamon squares from the Magnolia Table cookbook tonight. It's gonna be a late night biking, but I think it might be worth it. I'm very they're, excited. They're so good. Okay, um, when the world opens back up for travel, where do you wanna go? I eventually want to become fluent in French, so I wanna to go to Nice, France, and that might not be right away because that's gonna not be like a super cheap trip, um, but I would absolutely love to go there. It's like the mecca of European luxury fashion, and I just think that would be like really exciting to see. What is your best travel hack or travel tip? Oh, okay. Um, I overpack all of the time for traveling. It is like, it seriously annoys me every time I'm on a trip. I feel like I have 50 different outfits and they don't make any sense because I just like threw everything I could in the suitcase. So I think something I've been trying to do is like bring pieces that I can wear in two outfits. Like I can wear the same shirt, but it looks like a completely different outfit, but it's still like cohesive, you know, for like this is so ridiculous, but for my Instagram feed, it's going to look cohesive. Like I, you know, I have like an actual personal style instead of wearing 
things that I'm like so annoyed that I even brought on the trip. So that's probably my like biggest hack that I'm <laughs> myself trying to follow is like bring pieces that you can like wear in many different outfits. And on your Instagram feed, who is your official photographer? Does Levi take a lot of your pictures? Is your, is your mom out there taking your pictures? Like who is the photographer? Um, it usually is Levi, um, because like usually we're traveling together. My mom has stepped in on occasion when Levi just like can't do it anymore, but Levi also has a better phone than me. Um, so he might not always be behind the camera. Like if it's me being in the picture, I guess he's behind the camera, but I, um, recently was at the beach and I was like using his phone like crazy. So he actually recently made me go through it and delete all the pictures I didn't want, but he's he's gotten better he knows like you know how to hold the phone now he knows the angles to hit and um he knows i have to look through them just just to make sure you know like my hair is not in my face or something yes huge shout out to all the partners and friends and family members of asts out there during the pandemic who are helping us with our photo shoots <laughs> yes seriously i i do appreciate them more than they know i think <laughs> i love that uh and then last question um, what advice would you give to your 18 year old self? So looking back, what would you tell your 18 year old self? I would say, Cassidy, stop planning, um, because you literally never know what's around the corner. Um, but at some points when I like stopped trying to predict my own future and like plan out where I was going next, were some of like the best adventures I ever had or like some of the best things just like came out of the blue. Um, so I've really been trying to be mindful of that is like don't over plan because it leaves no room to have like some of those spontaneous adventures and um, then like I end up living a really rigid life and that's not always fun in some aspects it is but um, I like to think of like five years down the road where I really need to be thinking of like six months down the road like what are my goals for then um so yes I, I would tell 18 year old Cassidy to just like stop planning and to enjoy the moment oh, and that's great advice and uh, for all of the members who get the chance to listen to this um I hope that you have learned a little bit something a little bit of something about Cassidy tonight and her AST journey and her own personal story um, I think that's one of the myths that I want to bust about service on the National Council, other than that we don't live at headquarters, um, but that we're, you know, all real people, right, with jobs and personal lives and challenges, and, you know, we've had several members complete or start their doctorates while they've been on the council. Um, you know, we've had people who have graduated from college and have found a job or have switched jobs. You know, we've had moms on the council, right? Yep. So it is all it is all possible, but I think it's to your point, the connections and the sisterhood and the relationships that that make it possible. So thank you, Cassidy, for being willing to um, do this interview and this conversation. I don't think this is going to be the end. I think we're going to need to find more ways that we can engage with our members in a virtual environment. So we'll see where we go next. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you. Jamie, this was so fun and I had such a blast doing it. I can't wait to do similar things to this. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Well, thank you, Cassidy.